Welcome to Gray County Life at Home. I'm Mary J. Murray, and Rhonda is off today. I have invited my guest, David Shearman, to spend the first eight minutes with us. And David is the host of Politically Speaking. But because of his community engagement in so many areas, he really has the pulse on the community. And welcome, David, and thank you for taking the time this morning. Always a pleasure, Mary Jane. Always a pleasure. Well, there's a rhyme that we often say that goes, 30 days has September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31, except January. January has 973 days. So, <laughs> I, yep. There is truth to that. I, so, I've always said January is the longest month of the year. Yeah. So for January 22, yes, it seems like 973 days, but generally, how is our community doing? Um, my sense is generally we're okay. Crispy? I mean, people are tired. People are, I think, a little frustrated. I, excuse me. <coughs> I'm recovering from COVID, or at least what may have been COVID, and what's, that's what you're hearing. Anyway, I had an interesting conversation with someone in the grocery store yesterday. Actually, it was one of the clerks. And what he was saying is that there are a lot of people in the grocery stores. And I said, why? It's a place to go, he said. Hey, people, it's a safe place to go because you've got to keep distance. You have to wear a mask. Why, where else can you go? Go to the grocery store. Why not? Well, over the past two years, that's been my big adventure, the grocery store and the dentist. So out of those two, um, that's pretty, been, pretty much been my event. Um, and it's marked on the calendar as an event. Um, <laughs> But I was also tapping into a little bit of what the Bruce Gray Poverty Task Force and the information that they've been putting out. And it seems like we're still increasing the number of, 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 of dinners and meals that are being provided to the community. Yes. And what's really interesting is that the number of seniors who are um, who are taking advantage of meal programs and food banks is increasing and that's really um <clears throat> a somewhat disturbing number well I, i'm wondering about that whether it's because people can't get out the same way as as they have been able to in the in the past and you were saying that grocery store is the place that folks go to but um and, but there's also the, the growing need, I think, within our community in terms of homelessness and of folks needing to access a warm, a warm meal and a, and a safe place, even if it's just for a few minutes, to be able to go. So um, I have like a, a jump of four, 460 meals per day yes i think the other thing is that people on fixed income always bear the brunt always bear the brunt in a time of crisis because they've got x number of dollars <clears throat> and if the um, cost of food becomes x plus 25 they've got to make some very difficult choices well i've noticed in the grocery store that the prices are really jumping up mm -hmm. true i have too and it's in things like produce, bread, meat, um, canned goods, everything is going up. Uh, and it's only a few cents every once in a while, but it, it adds up, always adds up. Well, I think all of us need to be a little more careful about how we shop. But the other thing too, is I understand some of the shelves uh, are not being stocked the way they have been. And so we have to make other choices. 
I, I was reading actually some pieces about that in the, a variety of media today. And the issue is not that the food isn't there. It's these are supply chain issues. Sometimes it's a lack of drivers. Sometimes it's people off sick. Sometimes it's um, inability to, the, the stock may be in the back, but it's not, hasn't reached the shelf yet. And these are all complex issues that, that will get ironed out eventually. We all remember the great toilet paper hoarding case. I mean, let's face it, we all, we all, we all still have a little stash of toilet paper and Kleenex and paper towels. Uh, I don't know about your house, but ours does. Not a great number, but we had to plan for, for being um, isolated for two weeks in case of um, a, a COVID quarantine. But they assured us, the suppliers assured us, we got lots in the warehouse, it's just getting it to you that's the problem. And that's apparently where we are right now. It is not because there is a massive shortage. It is, it, there are issues, absolutely. And I understand that the, 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 um, the trucking industry is dealing with chronic shortages of, employer, of employees. But at the same time, um, the stuff is there. It's just may not be there today. It might be there tomorrow. In fact, I went looking for something yesterday at a grocery store, and they said, mm, it's probably ordered, but we don't know when the truck's coming in. might be today. might be Friday. Okay. Well, that just means that I change, change, make my menu choices a little differently. Well, I, I think, once again, we all have to pivot, and that's what we've been okay. doing. And I think that's why January seems like such a long time uh, for us in this particular 2022. And, uh, and thank you, David, for taking the time to, to chat with us today, because our time is up. And we are now uh, taking a break and going to commercial, and we'll be back right after these messages. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Yo. Yep. Okay, I'll be there. After a night out with your friends, there's always options for getting home safely. You could call your BFF, your mom or dad, whoever you can count on for a safe ride home. You could call your favorite cab company or one triple eight taxi guy, or you could use the Arrival Live smartphone app to help you choose your ride. Be it a friend, transit or taxi, getting home safely is app easy. Now available for iOS and Android devices. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive, drive sober. flying solo today with Rhonda being off. And we're really looking forward to her being back next week. Uh, just before I introduce my special guest today, I just want to mention that the Sweet Water Music Festival and 10 other music festivals are having some free online concerts 
And oh, we just need that music right now. And that begins on Friday, January the 28th. And if you wanna tap into some of these incredible music opportunities, just check in with sweetwatermusicfestival.ca for more information. And the uh, other community announcement is, of course, the Billy Bishop Museum is always busy doing something, even during lockdown. And they have now are, have launched their Going Public with Collections. And this is full access online to their collections. Um, so you don't even necessarily have to step into the museum, which we haven't been able to do um, only sporadically. But just check out with the Billy Bishop Museum dot catalog access dot com for a full viewing of their collection. And I'd like to welcome my guest, Nicole Amos, and she is a broker with the Mortgage Center. And today we're going to talk a little bit about money management, um, specifically in relation to mortgages. And welcome, Nicole, and thank you for taking the time today. Well, thank you, Mary Jane. I appreciate it. So Nicole and I were talking um, prior to the show around mortgages, and I haven't had a mortgage for over 20 years now, so I am really clueless as to what the landscape is like right now. But this being January, as I previously mentioned, with 973 days to it, <laughs> um, folks might be thinking about in the you know later in the year purchasing a home and so what should they be doing now to sort of budget for that uh, that's a great question um because as i guess if you haven't had a mortgage in the last few years i as you know the landscape has changed pretty significantly uh we now have what we call the stress test or the quote qualifying test, uh, which a lot of the lenders have implemented into their systems. Um, and those meaning that you have to actually qualify at either 5.25% um, or 2% above the contract rate. That's not what your more your contract rate would be when you for your mortgage is what you have to qualify for. So on the average, the a fixed rate right now could be around 269, 289%. They just few of them just went up overnight. So um, so if you're looking at that, so that's what your rate would be. But however, uh, you have to qualify almost double that amount, very similar. So um, you actually have to qualify for a much higher amount. And the reason why the government has done that uh, for reasons is basically if the interest rates do decide to jump up pretty significantly, they're kind of like um, proofing yourself so you're not going to get into a you know a bad financial situation. So one of the things that we do look at for clients is um, we kind of take a look at all the documents ahead of time, review everything. We have a have strategy session, and then we kind of review everything, income documents. We do pull the credit bureaus, and we kind of take a look at anything that may possibly put up a a yellow or a red flag for a lender. And it could be a no right, not right now, but let's try to fix A, B, and C and get you to where you need to go. So we always try to look at those things ahead of time um, because buying a house is a pretty big deal. And I have had clients um, come to me sort of last minute and they haven't had their taxes done from the previous year done, believe it or not, or a few different other options haven't been finished. So those are things that we do take a look at to make sure that you know we kind of get our ducks in a row in order to be in the best buying position moving forward. So it really seems much more complicated now than what we that I experienced um, several decades ago. Um, is it's a fact that it's, it's actually pre-planning. So how many months in advance should you start pre-planning? Um, because this may be the year to purchase or you may have to wait another year to purchase. 
Well, they say the best time to purchase is to buy a home is now because they, the value of real estate is really going to realistically either stay the same or increase. And over the last um, really 18 months, we've really seen that increase significantly. But, you know, if you are looking at, say, doing in the spring market, because it's usually a, a pretty busy time, or if you're looking at, you know, fall purchasing or whatever, um, it's probably a good idea, even six to nine months or even a possible year ahead of time, kind of like, have a conversation, see where you are with things, you know, like maybe you don't qualify for a type of home that you want because you need a higher down payment. So those are things that we discuss, or there could have been a credit blemish in the past that needs to be corrected. And that sometimes will take time. It may not be um, a fault of your own. It could be the credit, the creditor may have not registered something correctly on your account. So these are things that we all take a look at ahead of time. So anywhere between say six months to a year um, is probably a good time to to look at that now if you do feel you're in a very strong position financially as well as your credit's good you you do monitor your credit bureau on a regular basis then you can look at you know uh, less time to, prior to doing that for sure well we know that um the, the real estate market in our community has been very active over this last um, year two years and I think it has something to do with a lot of folks migrating from bigger cities to our community where our, our housing prices are um, less or better than, they get more for their dollar. But at the same time, um, it's still a balance between, because we always have a wish list. You know, that wish list can probably nuker us in, in some way. Um, so balancing the wish list with the reality and then with the mortgage. Yeah, that's, it's very true. So sometimes what happens is like, uh, that's part of our discovery call. When we talk to clients, it's like, you know, what ideally, what do you want or what do you have? And then I think what I'm finding that, um, that migration is, it's actually been really great actually for our area. We're seeing new people come into the area and we're actually seeing new younger families, believe it or not, come into our area. I think a lot of my first time home buyers have had a home somewhere else, or they've lived somewhere else and rented and they've had some sort of connections to the Grey Bruce area, you know, when somebody had a cottage here or the grandparents were in here. So they realized that the, the cost of living is a little bit less here. So they're taking what they're, because they're not able to do, you know, a $1.5 million for a townhouse in Toronto or Brantford or whatever. So they're taking that money because a lot of people are working from home still. Uh, they're able to move that uh, up here and they're able to purchase um, a little bit more of their, their what they, more house for what they have available to them. Um, um, and as for wish lists, no house is going to be exactly perfect. So you have to sort of comp do some compromises. And I, one thing I do sort of a little tongue in cheek humor with clients is they always want the best of the best is the, is the beer wages on the champagne taste. But when you're looking at an entry level, you do have to be realistic. Okay, this is this is what we're looking at for today. This may not be our forever home. So let's look at what's going to be best for our lifestyle right now. And then in five, 10, whatever time years, we can move to the, the home that has all our wishes or we can build that type of home. So those are things that, and that's also a conversation that a really good real estate would have with that client as well, moving forward to make sure that, you know, they do have all that sort of thing, all that information lined up and basically control their expectations in regards to things, because there's no sense going into a home uh, or putting an offer in a home unless you can afford it, because then it's going to cause extra stress for you and extra stress on, you know, everybody involved with it. And you may be without a home on closing day because all those, all those things didn't roll into place. So once again, kind of going back, to making sure that you kind of have a preview of what you it's affordable to you moving forward. Well, it almost sounds like you're um, the voice of reason. <laughs> I try to be. I, I, sometimes I give my clients a real stern talking to <laughs> uh, in regards to certain things. And, and, it's a, it, and sometimes, you know, they're like, oh, we really want to buy a house. Okay, well, let's look at your bank statements for the last six months. And it's one of those things where it's like, oh, you're spending $200 a week on, you know, coffees and eating out. Well, you multiply that by four weeks in a month times 12 months. 
that's going to be your part of a down payment. So those are things that we also have discussions with clients too, because it's just uh, it, the the reality of actually moving into a home because you know, although people are renting, they're paying, you know, quite, quite a high rent amount in our area. But when they move into a home, there's all those extra things that you don't necessarily know about. Like, you know, like your house insurance is going to be more, and then you have the cost of water if you're living in Owen Sound, uh, and different other factors, you know, all of a sudden that you need, you know, um, pointing done in your home, or you need your ease trough fix because you have a really bad, you know, flow of snow or pulled it off or wind or whatever. So these are all things that, you know, they have to take a look at and have that little bit of emergency fund available. So it's not just moving into a home, it's actually being a home owner, which is giving it a little bit more of a edge basically. Yeah. So is there, is there a checklist um, for, for folks uh, that are going into a home for all the things that they have to consider their, their taxes, their um, water bills, their heating bills, that sort of thing. Is there a bit of a checklist for folks to sort of say, okay, these are all the things that I have to think about. And so maybe I don't have to have as many coffees uh, or eat out um, every day for lunch. Maybe I can brown bag it a few times <laughs> just so that I can put those extra dollars into uh, preparing for uh, a new home. Yeah, I actually have a one page worksheet that I actually send out to some clients. And it's, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's basically live in the home that you are now in. So instead of having a rent, then you would put in, okay, this is what your mortgage payment would be. And this is what your property taxes are. It's a really reality check because they're, they're basically going to be looking at you know, um, the affordability. Okay. We're, we're living in a rental property right now, but we're, we're living like we're living in a home. So they're going to be able to uh, take those monies that they're using and allocate it to, you know, they can spend it, they can put in their savings account for that home, but they're getting a real reality check in regards to moving into a home and what that the actual cost would be. Well, things have really progressed to put in safeguards for families, uh, for individuals and families who are looking into getting into uh, purchasing a home or purchasing a condo, that sort of thing, um, which is very different from the time when uh, decades ago, when it was more like a free for all, and we had yeah. to figure all those things out ourselves. So I really appreciate the job that you're doing to safeguard families from getting in over their head. Yeah, but, but we know that um, interest rates for mortgages fluctuate. Um, and personally, we were caught in the early 80s when it went up to like 19 percent, um, which is, I'm sure, unheard of these days. And we're in a, in a very stable financial situation. But because of that increase in the in the mortgage rate, we could have lost our house. Um, so who actually controls the mortgage rates now? Because they've never been that high again. So the Bank of Canada um, actually today happens to be announced for the Bank of Canada and 50% and of, I guess, our industry is saying they're going to increase it by 0.25%. So the Bank of Canada prime rate will increase. So they're looking at that. So the Bank of Canada basically modifies that and that ba will actually look at more what the discount is on a variable rate. Um, but it's more about... Uh, the, the, the economists within each lender uh, that basically will say a rate. And sometimes if you see one of them start, start increasing, the other, all the lenders, uh, the other lenders will like, oh, we need to increase our rates as well. Now, sometimes that just happens and it will be fluctuating. So um, rates right now, I said, are high twos for a fixed rate. Uh, they were just been increased. They've actually increased, I think, two or three times since the beginning of January because we've seen these economic stability sort of moving forward. Um, with that being said, when, when, um, you know, but they will fluctuate and it would fluctuates on its own and there's no, uh, I wouldn't say rhyme or reason in regards to it, but there is some economic factors in regards to it, but even at a two and a half or 3% or three and a half interest rate, realistically in the grand scheme of things is still really inexpensive money to purchase a home. So compared to the 19% that you have had, I remember 
uh, when we moved here in 1980, my, my, that's how I got here. My dad, I remember him coming home from the bank and negotiating uh, really strongly. And he said, yeah, I got a 20% interest rate. And I'm just like, like when you're a kid, you mean nothing. Now, if you put 20% interest rate on a $500,000 home, that's going to be a huge mortgage payment, right? So, and that's one of the reasons why they put the stress test in as well to modify that, to make sure that people are not going to be losing their homes. And that was also after the whole housing crisis in the States. Now, that being said, how the states do mortgages is totally different from Canada. So I cannot see that happening here um, in Canada, but that's one of the reasons why they did implement the stress test and that's more government regulated. Wow, I, 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 we, were, we just have three minutes left. This has okay. gone by so quickly. <laughs> um, well, I'm open anytime, yeah, yeah. There, um, just quickly, but I understand, is there more than one style of mortgage? Because oh yeah. I'll so quickly, if you yeah, no problem. Them off. <laughs> yeah, no, I can do that. So uh, there is actually several different types of mortgages. So for purchases, uh, you can have a high ratio mortgage, which is less than twenty percent down, which means the you're paying the insurer's premium. And we actually have three insurers in Canada. We have. Um, most commonly known Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, Sajin, formerly known as Genworth, and Canadian Guarantee. And when you pay that insurance premium, you're, it's actually encompassed into your principal and interest payment that you pay on a monthly or biweekly basis. And that actually goes... Uh, if you ever default, that goes to the lender. We also have conventional mortgages, so it's more than 20% down, construction mortgages, purchase plus improvements, home equity loans, reverse mortgages, uh, HELOCs or home equity line of credit, as well as second and sometimes even third mortgages on property. So it depends on what your the client needs, and that's going to be part of our strategy session is what we look at. Wow. And how is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. You've given us lots to think about. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that we've heard so much about is this reverse mortgage. And I think that I think that, that might be another time where we can invite you back Sure. to actually talk more about that because I think that is something that is kind of really in the forefront for a lot of seniors and and what that can do to benefit their life and perhaps what are the red flags in that. But yeah, they, a lot of, yeah, you see more and more um, uh, lenders are actually getting into the reverse mortgage field. So it is definitely a growing uh, trend in the industry. Okay, well, thank you so much, Nicole. This is very welcome. Really enlightening. And um, hopefully, we'll see you again uh, for another uh, session on Great sure. County Life. Anytime. Uh, I can talk about mortgages all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, and we're going to just break for these messages. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Michael Cheney was one of over 150,000 Indigenous children that were taken to residential schools between the 1800s and 1996. My uncle ran away from school wanting to get home to his mom and dad, and sadly he didn't make it and died of exposure. When Gord Downey found out about my late uncle Cheney's story, he wrote Secret Path, a series of poems that became an album, then a graphic novel, a documentary, and a concert. Gord met my family and together we formed the Gord Downey and Cheney Winjack Fund. Together we are sharing Secret Path and other reconciliation resources with legacy schools, setting up legacy spaces across Canada, and hosting events like Secret Path Week to inspire all Canadians to engage in reconciliation. action. Before he left us, Gord asked us all to do something. You're gonna figure it out. Will you join us? Together we can make Canada a better place. Hi, I'm Cedric Gano, and I'm a center for the Owen Sound Attack. Catch great OHL action on Rogers TV as we bring you Owen Sound Attack games live, both home and away. Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active.
Welcome back to Gray County Life at Home. And just before I introduce our next guest, I have a couple more uh, community updates that I just want to remind folks about. We are very much in these changing times, and even though our organizations plan all these special events, all of a sudden, they need to be online. And that's unfortunate, but we still hope that the donations will come in to support the organizations. And Safe and Sound Fundraiser, the coldest night of the year, which is very popular in our community, is now going to be a virtual event. And that will be Saturday, February 26th. So please check with a Safe and Sound website uh, for more details. And of course, February 2nd is always an anchor day in our communities for the Wyerton Willie Festival. And this year, it is now going to be streamed live on a Bayshore Broadcasting News Center because, once again, we can't have the live event. But February 2nd is a landmark for Wyerton Willie and when it's going to be spring. But February 2nd is also close to my heart because that is the birthday of my oldest son, who is now an adult and has children of his own. So happy birthday, Chris, for February 2nd. Now, our guest today is Stuart Reed, who is the executive director of the Community Foundation Gray Bruce. And it's always a pleasure, Stuart, to have you on board. And I have a very specific topic area to talk to you about today. And that is when, when folks want to put together an award in memory of someone, particularly the Darlene Van Wick uh, Memorial Award for Media Studies. But one of the questions is like, how do you do that? How, if people are out there thinking about that in memory of, how would they go about it? Well, Mary Jane, we're, we're here to help. Um, our tagline and our logo says we're here for good. That's what we hope to do. So people should contact the Community Foundation office and talk about their wishes and we can see what we can do to assist. Um, we do have some um, process in place for um, setting up a scholarship bursary or an award. Um, we have a threshold of um, $5,000 is usually the case when, when we start a fund, but um, in instances like uh, Darlene's award where um, then friends and family came together and decided to do that. We, we understand the intent is to build it to the threshold, so it'll be granting out. So, so we, we start the fund and we get it up online so we can receive donations. And often at that time, it's important to act quickly so people can, so we can receive, uh, give a tax receipt to those people that are donating through our charity to support the ongoing awards. So, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, so if people are considering it, um, they can just give us a call at 519-371-7203 uh, um, and, uh, and talk to us about what you'd like to do. And we can t t talk you through the steps and make, make sure it, it happens um, in accordance with your, with your wishes. Um, it's a lovely thing to, um, to recognize someone and to establish a tribute scholarship like uh, was done for Darlene Van Wick. And um, her name will be associated with that good work um, every year in perpetuity. And um, um, people that are making donations to that fund can be assured that the, you know, the the capital gifts are invested. And then each year we'd be giving out an award that'll help some young person that's on a career path uh, similar to Darlene's in communication. So it's a it's a great great way to uh, memorialize someone and to. Um, um, pay a tribute, and we're very pleased to uh, help out when when that occasion arises. Well, one of the questions that came to me was that um, the fund will slowly meet that five thousand dollar base, but what happens um, if that doesn't sort of come in one sort of lump sum where you can actually start moving that um, and preparing for a scholarship? Um, if the funds are coming in gradually over time or over a year period, what actually happens to that fund in the meantime? Well, at the, at the community foundation, we, um, all the gifts that come in, we call the capitals. We never touch the capital. So that continues to build and it makes money in the investment pool. So the fund will grow organically uh, year to year until it reaches the threshold. Um, 
we, uh, we, you know, but we keep in touch with the uh, fund initiators too. So, you know, we, we support um, their work in spreading the word and try and make it easy for people to uh, make donations and, and make people aware of, of that fund as a, as a repository for their, for their donation. We also promote our, all of our funds on Canada Helps and uh, online giving is increasingly the way that people like to make donations. So we make sure to make it easy as possible that way. So we, we help and encourage it to build. As I mentioned, um, in the, we have two funds of investment and most of our education or award funds are in our dividend pool of investment, which is, you know, blue chip equity that generates a regular dividend. So the gains and losses are, are a little bit more level and it, it uh, regularly um, pays out dividends to make sure we're supporting our scholarships regularly. So the, the threshold for payout is 7,500. So usually to open a fund is $5,000. They build to 7,500 and then that generates the grant every year, which um, is aligned with the scholarship. And um, the process for that as well is open to discussion with the donors. Sometimes um, people or families like to make those decisions themselves. The community foundation can open an application form, spread the word to students regionally about this opportunity. And uh, you can either make use of the um, foundation's education review team who are um, very well-informed individuals who have a history in education that help us make decisions, or you can um, chime in and, and get engaged with the decision-making yourself when it comes time to select a recipient for the award. Well, I, I really value the fact that the, uh, um, the family members of the award have input into uh, how much is given and the, the time frames and that sort of thing. So it's not just set up and off you go, but there is the engagement of the family members. That's right. And, and um, we do sign an agreement with the uh, original donors that sets out the parameters and the goals for the fund. And we try and keep those broad in charitable purposes because things change over time. And, and, um, yeah, so we we um, we uh, work with work through that conversation um, at the originating stages, and that that guides our work in uh, in all the years to come. Well, how uh, how many times a year are the awards given? Well, scholarships are usually annually, and um, just this coming uh, Thursday. Um, our applications go live on our website so students can begin to look and shop through the catalog of awards that are available and make applications to support their education pathway. Scholarships, of course, we try and give out before the uh, school year begins in September. So um, the deadline is April 15th for um, intake and then we adjudicate those over the summer and try and get the money in the hands of students um, before their academic year begins in September. So that's an annual process. So it's a once a year payout for scholarships. And that's a real bonus for students. I know that some of these awards may not be huge dollars, but everything is important to try and keep down that student debt. Yes, and um, a lot of students don't know about the uh, foundation runs a website called payforschoolgraybruce.com. And it's a one-stop shop for students that are interested in finding out what's out, what's out there that's available to support them in their education pathway. And you can plug in the, the course of study that you're um, planning on, the school you're going to, and it'll sift through all the available awards and tell you um, which ones to apply for. So I really encourage people to, to check that out. Again, it's um, payforschoolgreatbruce.com. And um, it's, a, it's a great tool that um, we, we try and make people aware of, especially young people who are beginning that, uh, that uh, pathway. <laughs> and uh, we all know how expensive tuition and the cost of uh, education are. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that they know about all the resources that are available to help them uh, on that pathway. Now, are all the awards for post-secondary, are there any awards that are given out for high school students? Yes, there are awards for high school students. There's also um, in Gray Bruce, we try and um, support um, diverse pathways for education. So there are some that are for trades, for apprenticeship, for work workplace tra training. So um, people should yeah, become acquainted with what's available um, in the uh, payforschoolgraybruce.com. And is this being promoted in all of the high schools? Yes, we reach out to um, the guidance counselors every year to talk about the uh, the website 
And um, often some schools have their own awards um, internally. So um, it's great for students to check in with their guidance office at, at high school to see um, what's available internally. We try and list all those on our site too. So it's funds that are available through the foundation. But if we hear about other funds in the community, we list those too. So it's we, we try and build a, a good index of um, um, scholarships, bursaries, and awards that are available in our region. Well, when you called it a one-stop shop, uh, you, you weren't kidding, actually. Uh, it's very complex as to what is available out there and sifting it, sifting through it and trying to find uh, what is going to meet your needs. This is amazing, Stuart. I mean, I didn't realize how in-depth this was. Well, we had um, support from um, the Ontario Trillium Foundation a number of years back that helped us build that site. And uh, each year we, we renew all the links. So it is a great resource. Uh, and um, our work is to get the word out and to make sure it's well used by, uh, by uh, people in our area. Wow. Uh, I know that the Community Foundation is really an anchor in our community in terms of supporting supporting not-for-profit organizations through a lot of their granting programs. And now I'm learning more about what you're supporting for the awards and scholarship uh, programs. Uh, and so the Community Foundation has many pillars in the community in terms of their support. We do. And um, it, was, it was a number of years ago that our then Governor General David Johnson kind of gave a challenge um, uh, to uh, community foundations across Canada to become, to help Canada become a more smart and caring nation. And our foundation um, set a goal to add $1 million in endowed education funds to support students locally. And in 2016, we celebrated the, the achievement of that. So we have over $1.8 million of endowed funds that generate grants every year. So it is a big function of ours. And um, um, great storytelling about the um, impacts on students' lives with uh, with the support we're able to administer on behalf of the generous donors that are here, are here locally, and um, and also you know passing along the story about about amazing um, citizens like Darlene and and the good work they did and the and the amazing things they did in our community. It's that that story's passed with the uh, with the grant every year and keeps her keeps her work and and uh, and uh, vision alive. Well, I'm I'm very grateful for the, the the few folks that gathered and thought about this and set it up and put it in motion, um, because um, when when someone uh, passes away, there's always a grieving process, and there's always the sense of what can I do to help. So setting up an award in someone's memory. Um, helps to ease that grieving process and feeling that I have done something to help and now in perpetuity. That's right. And, um, you know, I, I agree with you, Mary, Mary Jane, those times, uh, you know, at the time of someone's death, it's, it's often very stressful and there's a lot, a lot of considerations and things to do. And so we really encourage people to consider their, their can think about that giving um, the act of giving before that time comes along, and and if you if that's something you'd like to see in your own estate planning, then um, we're here to do that now. So it's all in place and ready to activate. You know when the time comes. So um, we really encourage people to think about that. Um, and if you have questions about what you could do um, yourself with your own philanthropic plan, um, give us a call. Um, we can um, make some resources available and tell you um, how how the uh, activation works and and maybe set something up now that is ready to go when when the time comes for you. Well, the pre-planning, <laughs> actually. Um, I, we were just talking to uh, Nicole Amos from the Mortgage Center, and she was talking about the pre-planning. So I think there's many stages in our lives where we really need to think about pre-planning for the future. And I actually have, we now have another one on the checklist to think about pre-planning. Yeah, it's... Um... Those are important conversations to have, you know, uh, um, we uh, getting things in order. It just makes it things easier for our family and friends and those around us that, that, that are uh, acting on our wishes when they're, they're clearly expressed and, and, and put down on paper. Um, it just makes everything 
simpler and uh, you know you you get to craft your own legacy um, while you're here and that that's that gives you great power and satisfaction as well I think well I, I like the way that you actually phrase that and that is crafting your legacy um, are you finding that more people are doing that in our community uh, yes, um, you know, uh, every year we add more and more funds to our to our growing list of um, endowed funds, and uh, I think it's a very um, it's a very um, attractive uh, proposal for people to think that um, a gesture like that it, it'll exist forever and it'll continue to do good things, and um, it can um, memorialize someone's name or add someone's name to a list. And I, I mentioned, you know, that story carries on, and uh, it's a it's a great way to kind of uh, uh, drop a stone in a pond and and think about the ripples kind of uh, following us for 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 many generations to come. It's a great great gesture. Well, I'm very impressed with the educational funds of 1.8 million because building our future is so so very important. And I think at this time it is more important than it has ever been because we are facing so many challenges. And the best resources that we can provide for our students uh, to build their future is such a huge investment in how we're going to be as a country going forward. I always think that there's there's such hope in in education too. You know, great minds and nurturing young people to be the best they can be. That's how we're going to solve all the problems that face us. Is uh, is through supporting each other. Uh, to learn and to to flourish and to become your your best potential. Well, I'm very grateful for the growth of the Community Foundation and all the good works that it does. And it's always a delight, Stuart, to talk to you about what is happening. That we really just focus. We've really just focused on uh, the awards, the endowments, and the uh, scholarships at, at this point. But I know that the Community Foundation is always doing bigger things in the community. And uh, we'll have to have you come back again. You're one of our frequent flyers to talk about some of the other things that are happening in, uh, in our communities. Um, and, and and it's always it's always a pleasure. So thank you very much, Stuart, for taking the time. And I'm so glad that we got that link to work. My pleasure, Mary Jane. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks so much for the invitation. Okay. Take good care. Thank you. Bye now. Hello everyone, your host Antoine Hashem here on the couch and welcome to season eight. Yay! Eight seasons and we've got a lot of awesome guests coming up so keep watching. It's about sharing and caring. It's about doing and belonging. It's about living life to its fullest. And it's about laughing out loud. We are L'Arche Canada, and we're about witnessing and sharing the gifts of all people. Learn more about us today. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, some people used the A word. They called it an accident, but it wasn't. An accident implies that no one was at fault. But when someone impaired by alcohol and or drugs chooses to drive, they are fully responsible for the crash that can result. So please, for the memory of my brother DJ and the thousands of families whose lives have been shattered by impaired drivers, let's drop the A word. A crash caused by impaired driving is not an accident. Hi, I'm Gavin Bryant. Sign in with the Owen Sound Attack. Catch great OHL action on Rogers TV as we bring you Owen Sound Attack games live, both home and away.
Welcome back to Gray County Life at Home. And this is one of our most popular segments of the show. And that is our adorable adoptables. Now, Renee is off today. Both Rhonda and Renee are off today. But we have a wonderful uh, Aislinn to step in and she is Renee's daughter. So I think she probably knows just about <laughs> enough uh, information as Renee does. And it's lovely to have you, Aislinn. Thank you so much. And you have an adorable adoptable right there. Yeah. So this is Fish. He's not too old. However, he's pretty big for his age. He's about 10 months old and he's a neutered male and he's very sweet. <laughs> well, he looks very comfortable there. He is. I had him on the chair beside me, but he's decided to take over my lap and that's okay. Fish, it has actually kind of an interesting story on why his name is Fish. So he was actually found with some fish hooks stuck to him. So they were actually inside of his skin. So he's had a couple surgeries. He's all good now. But yeah, it took him quite a while to get used to humans again. So we have a feeling that someone along the line wasn't too nice to him. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he's got a pretty sad story, but it's oh. happy now. Wow. Well, I'm so glad that he is on the upswing now and uh, seems to be uh, comfortable being held and cuddled and looking probably for a very nurturing home. Definitely. And Fish is good. He is learning to like dogs and cats. Still a little bit timid of children, but he is getting better and he's now looking for a home. So if he's a little bit intimidated with children, then maybe he's better in a home with um, adult, more older children, not adult children, but older <laughs> children and, and adults who like to have uh, a, a cat to, to cuddle with. Absolutely. He would do well in an older, quiet home. It's I wouldn't say that he would not get used to children, but for now, he's definitely better with older children or a quieter home in general. <laughs> well, he's looking pretty content. Now, one of the things that I've always asked Renee, and I'm not sure you know the answer to this, yeah. But last week we had Maya on the show, and she was a Jack Russell, and I always check in to find out how the the previous adorable adoptable is making out. So how's Maya doing? So Maya is good. She has a pending adoption. So I do believe she's supposed to go home on Friday. So happy ending for her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, most of the times when I check in, there is always a happy ending. For some breeds, particularly dogs, it takes a little bit longer, especially when they're larger dogs or older dogs um, that um, that maybe have some challenges with them that that uh, take a little bit longer and then we have those that are scooped up immediately absolutely maya being a little bit older definitely took her a little bit longer than expected but she will be going home very shortly which is always good that's great now is, is the um with the lockdown again and the open and closed and open and closed, how is the Owen Sound Animal Shelter doing? Um, because we've just gone through another round of restrictions and now we think things are going to be opening up again. Yeah, so we're still doing everything by appointment only, which of course makes it a little bit challenging to book everyone in. Um, we are doing everything still from the parking lot and doing cattery visits, which is also kind of difficult with the snow because cats don't like the cold. <laughs> so it's a little bit challenging, but we've been making it happen and we're still having adoptions, which is wonderful as always. Well, I, I see that um, the, the animal shelter has never stopped doing the, its good works through whatever situation that you're faced with. Um, but when I was talking with Renee last week, she mentioned that 
the Betty White Memorial Fund um, has sparked uh, a lot of donations to animal shelters, probably throughout North America. And, and your shelter has been a recipient as well. And I hope that those donations are continuing to come in. Yes, they are continuing to come in. And those donations to things like the Betty White is definitely what helps us with our surgeries like fish here. Those donations went towards his surgery. All of the donations that we do get, it goes to either spay or neuter or when we have emergency situations, just like fish did with getting his fish hooks removed. <laughs> Um, so he didn't come with another name. This was a, 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 a cat that was abandoned. Yes, so fish was a stray, and unfortunately he was found. I believe there was three fish hooks actually stuck to him. Um, one of them he did try to pull out on his own, which caused a little bit of muscle damage. However, he's all good now, all fixed up, but that's how Renee gave him his name, Fish. <laughs> So he seems to respond to that very well. A little bit, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, with the, the animals help, we're down to the last two minutes of the show, and I'm just wondering, Aislinn, is there any other information that you would like to give us about the shelter? I don't know whether you have any fundraisers coming up other than the Betty White, and you're always grateful to receive that. But sometimes Renee will mention things like you need cat food or dog food or yeah. something like that. So right now, obviously, um, yeah, we're still accepting donations for the Betty White fundraiser. And like I mentioned earlier, all of that does go towards spaying and neutering as well as our emergency surgeries, um, which is always, always needed. Um, we are in need of, I believe, cat, adult cat dry food right now. So we're always accepting that any cleaning supplies, newspaper. We seem to be almost out of newspaper, which we use for the cat's litter boxes here. So if you have any old newspaper you'd like to donate, we'll definitely take it. Um, other than that, I think that everything's pretty good. But yeah, we're always accepting donations so that, of course, we can help more furry friends. <laughs> and so what about things like um, soft things, like pillows or towels or things like that? Yeah, we're always accepting stuff like that as well. Um, no, we don't take too many pillows. If you have towels over pillows, that's great because the dogs like to go a little bit crazy with the pillows and it creates quite a mess. But we do accept them. Um, the cats love them for beds, towels, yeah, paper towels, anything like that. We're always grateful for any donation. Well, thank you very much, Aislinn, for joining us today. And let's hope that Fish finds a really warm, loving family. Uh, he's had such a hard time. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. My husband is a wonderful man and a great father when he's not drinking. I'm so angry he chooses alcohol over us. If he really loved us, he'd stop drinking. 